Hi, my name is Katie Ma, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute at the University of Toronto, with an educational and clinical practice background in nursing and occupational therapy. Today I'd like to share a reflection with you titled, Learning Qualitative Research, Nudging My Inner Health Scientist. I'll explain why I describe this process as a nudge, but first I'd like to provide a little detail about my background. Then I'll reflect on my journey from the health to social sciences, focusing on the struggles I've faced in learning to think qualitatively, what this process has looked like, as well as the strategies I have developed and the forms of support I found helpful along the way. My area of study is childhood concussion, and my research affiliation is a children's rehabilitation hospital where I'm supervised by a clinician scientist with a background in occupational therapy. I'm fortunate to be part of a very large and well-supported lab in terms of resources, administrative support, and social support. But despite the number of students in my lab, I'm the only student undertaking qualitative health research. I was initially brought into the lab to be part of a quantitative concussion study. I won't go into the details of that study, but Suffice it to say that while I understood the value and importance of that work, the questions that were being asked didn't really speak to who I was as a clinician or who I thought I was as a novice researcher. After some twists and turns and frank discussions with my supervisor, I can say that where I am now is a far cry from where I started out. Today, I identify as a qualitative arts-based health researcher, but we'll get back to that a little later on. Luckily, my supervisor was incredibly supportive of the path I've taken, but was very transparent that he was not well versed in qualitative research or in how to pursue the learning I felt I needed. I stumbled upon the Centre for Critical Qualitative Health Research at the University of Toronto, and I'm so thankful that I did. I've since taken a number of courses, including foundational courses that have helped me think through my method and methodology, a course focused on the place of theory in health and healthcare that helped me develop my theoretical framework, and most recently a course in analysis and interpretation that has been invaluable in these later stages of my doctoral work. Through all of my coursework, I spoke very openly about my attempts to have my research remain relevant in health and rehabilitation sciences, while exploring this new world of social sciences and theory-informed qualitative research. But when asked to reflect on this transition, I felt at a bit of a loss as to how to describe my process. I kept coming back to this idea of nudging. This is really how I see my journey, as a gentle and gradual push from thinking like a clinician to thinking like a qualitative health researcher. I've had to move gently away from framing my thinking and research questions through practice models and from being motivated only by clinical outcomes and I've had to nudge myself toward pursuing not only clinical change, but also knowledge, toward accepting that knowledge is change, toward an acquisition of new language and an understanding that words are powerful and word choice matters. To do this, I've had to unlearn ideas about qualitative research and the right way to produce knowledge through research that I've carried with me from my undergraduate education. Now, when I speak of producing knowledge or knowledge production, I'm referring to the ways that knowledge comes out of the research process. This has been a shift for me, and one that has required me to stop thinking about knowledge production in linear terms, with an objective researcher collecting data from a passive subject, as is more typical in quantitative research. I've had to accept that knowledge is not possessed, given, or taken, but is actively created. I've had to start thinking about knowledge production in more fluid terms, as a collaborative process in which the reflexive researcher works with active and engaged participants to generate data and produce knowledge. This might be best understood with an example from my own work. Now, as I've said, my area of research is concussion, specifically childhood concussion. Current clinical guidelines tell us that we should be individualizing care to the needs of the child, but very little direction is provided regarding how exactly to do this. The pediatric clinician in me asks, what are children's needs when it comes to rehabilitation after concussion? And what are their needs when it comes to education to prevent concussion? But the scientist in me thinks we need an even more basic understanding of how children conceptualize concussion, that is, how they think and feel about it, before we can begin to ask these more specific questions. So I've started asking children, I'm using drawing as an arts-based research method along with qualitative interviewing 
to explore how children with and without a history of concussion conceptualize concussion. I won't go into all the fine details, but what I want to illustrate is that this is an active process and one that I'm implicated in as much as each participant is. The participant produces their drawing and then we talk about it. They share the meaning of it, who they would like to share their message or story with and why. Our conversation serves to begin to interpret their data. In this way, they are actively involved in the knowledge that is created through research. To think like a qualitative research, researcher, I've also had to learn how to own and occupy my work, how to be creatively present in data analysis and interpretation, how to insert myself and my voice into my writing, and how to be comfortable doing all of this within my discipline and research setting. But there have been struggles along the way, and I'll outline these, not to dissuade you from pursuing qualitative health research, but to assure you that you're not alone in any uncertainty that you may be feeling. Now, you'll notice that I use the present tense to describe my struggles, and this is intentional. As my struggles are ongoing and are ones that I am sure will continue throughout my trainee years and into my research career. The first struggle is language, or knowing how to talk the talk. In the beginning, I really struggled with this. I needed the right words to adequately communicate what it was that I wanted to do with my work. A lot of my language was very positivist leaning or language more typical of quantitative researchers due to my academic and clinical backgrounds. I wanted to think differently, but didn't have the tools or the language to do this. I also needed to be able to speak to both sides, meaning those in the social sciences and the health sciences. I was learning a lot in my coursework and beginning to think and speak differently, but I had to be careful not to distance myself from my health and rehabilitation colleagues, as this was still where I wanted my work to fit in the end. The second struggle is defending the place of qualitative research in health. Now, of course, there are groups that recognize the value of qualitative health research, but there are others that may not understand the contributions that qualitative health research can make beyond being an adjunct to quantitative research. Qualitative work is not always a precursor to quantitative work or used to elaborate on quantitative findings. Qualitative work done well can stand on its own. I felt that to do qualitative health research well, I needed to engage in coursework beyond that required of my program. I needed to learn the foundational concepts, but I also felt I needed to develop my sociological thinking. In arguing for my case, I found myself defending the place of theory. I understood how theory could strengthen my work, but theory-informed qualitative health research is not yet the standard in the rehabilitation sciences. The last struggle is how much is enough, or where to start and when to stop with coursework, with reading, with theory. That is, how much is realistic for me to know now in order to provide depth to my work and to successfully defend my dissertation, and how much is too much? In other words, what can I read and learn now, and what can be placed on my lifelong learner to-do list? As I mentioned, my learning process has really been a process of nudging or moving that dial gently and gradually. I've had to learn how to be patient. While I was engaged in my coursework, I had to accept that I couldn't know it all from the very beginning. I was undergoing a change in identity, and I had to accept that this couldn't happen overnight. This was exhausting and even overwhelming at times, but mostly it was exciting. But I do remember feeling like I was getting less out of my coursework and the readings than those coming from other disciplines, such as the social sciences. In time, I, I've come to realize that it wasn't less knowledge so much as it was different knowledge. I was learning what I needed to learn and was ready to learn in that time and place. I know that if I were to take any of the courses again, I would have new insights and new learnings for two reasons. First, I think that what you take from a course depends in part on what stage you're at in your research process. Second, and relatedly, I found that the courses that I took complemented each other, so that one course would prime me to take away what I needed to learn from the next. Also important to my process was letting go of ego and not being afraid to ask questions that might have quite obvious answers to students coming from other backgrounds, such as, what does problematize even mean, and can't I just accept something for what it claims to be, knowing that the answer to this was a hard no? I can speak to these struggles somewhat facetiously now, but at the time these were real, real questions I had that it seemed everyone else had the answers to and that I had to work out through engaging with my readings 
my classwork mates, and qualitative instructors. Probably most important to my learning process has been having a space to test out or try on my learning. As I mentioned, I struggled with this idea of legitimacy in rehabilitation sciences, but having opportunities to test my ideas out in a rehab context has led to a lot of growth and some big successes. I've learned that one of the best ways to set the stage for my work is to be able to justify why thinking about a problem in a different way than it has been thought about before might give us new insights and might be useful clinically. I found that if I'm able to do this before presenting my work, I'm much better able to gain buy-in or present what I do as legitimate and useful. These opportunities have also let me play around with my language. I've had to ask myself what language communicates that I'm thinking differently and what language creates distance. My journey to becoming a qualitative researcher has been challenging and there have been additional struggles to be sure, but I've really come to embrace these struggles for the growth they've inspired and the confidence they've given me. But I would not have been able to face these struggles alone and that's where building a community of support became really important to me. I was never made to feel like I didn't belong in my qualitative courses. In my first course, I remember being told more than once, any one of you is capable of getting an A on this paper. This statement was not about marks, but was meant to instill confidence in our abilities. Even still, I remember doubting the truth of this statement. But as my learning continued and my identity, thinking and language began to shift, I did start to believe this. I found it extremely helpful to have the opportunity to receive support from qualitative instructors in advance of submitting papers or presenting seminars. In the courses I took, it was an expectation that you discuss your intended topic, project outline, and even your key references with the instructor by email or in person prior to writing your paper or preparing your seminar. I can't tell you the number of hours I spent preparing for these meetings or to write these emails but it was well worth it to help develop my ideas, to receive feedback or direction to additional references in advance of completing the work. This level of engagement from course instructors was new to me, and in retrospect, I can see that it was integral to my learning. My community of support also included other trainees who were undergoing similar shifts in thinking and identity. Lastly, I found it helpful and even necessary to have a supervisor who's been supportive of my path and of the amount of coursework that this has required. Probably what eased the transition the most was continued exposure to leaders in the field and to real work being done. For example, in my coursework, instructors shared their written work from field notes and analytic memos through to published manuscripts and spoke openly about their research process. This gave life to the published manuscripts and provided a behind the scenes glimpse of how to do qualitative research well. I've also had the opportunity to hear qualitative experts speak at workshops, talks, and methodology conferences, and in my rehabilitation research setting. From a more pragmatic place, I've learned a number of tips and tricks along the way, including looking up the background of theorists to understand the time and place in which their ideas emerged, maintaining a list of terminology, so sociological or research terminology, to use as a quick reference guide when reading and writing, tracking the evolution of my research question and making note of how and why it has changed, which is often evident through how my language has evolved, and doing the same with the title of my work, again, keeping track of why and how it's changed. I won't leave you with the impression that I'm at the end of my journey or that I'm over the discomfort I've felt along the way. Right now, especially as I analyze and interpret my data and write up my work, I often feel stuck in this in-between place, between health science and social sciences, that isn't entirely comfortable, but I know this discomfort is essential for my growth. I'm also stuck knowing how to do enough, that is, knowing how to integrate the right amount of theory to make my work sound in the social sciences, yet appealing and useful in the health sciences. But I'm content being stuck in these places, as I know my work is better for it. The key thoughts I'd like to leave you with are that if you undertake this journey, there will be struggles and there will be times of discomfort, but there will also be many opportunities to build your community of support. I know that if I had not invested the time and energy to really learn qualitative health research, I would not be in the final stretch of my PhD or not in a way that made me proud of the work I've done and confident that my work will have relevance, both clinically and methodologically. 
Yes, it has been challenging. It has stretched me beyond what I thought I was capable of at times, but it has made me a better and more thoughtful researcher. And that has been my goal all along. Mm -hmm.